case you want to have anything to be here, right at the start. It's your choice. We are ready. I guess. Um, hi, I'm Aparna. And we're going to be presenting this paper that's titled, So Which One Is It? Uh, the Effect of Alternative Incremental Architectures in High Performance Game Playing Agent. Um, I know that's a lot of complicated words, uh, but um, just don't worry. we'll just walk you through the details of the paper, so don't worry. Um, okay, so uh, the paper is basically implementing this game playing agent, which is called E. Um, so, and they use something called incremental processing to uh, improve its performance in playing this game. Um, we'll talk about incremental processing later, but let's first look at what the game is about. Uh, the game is called the RPG game. Um, it has a, it's a two-player game. Um, one person's called the director and the other one's called the matcher. Uh, both the director and the matcher are uh, given a set of images, a common set of images, and the director has one image of, um, um, from that set, which is highlighted, and the director is supposed to describe that image um, in, in a way that helps the person, the matcher, distinguish it from the other images, and they can guess which image the director is talking about. So it's simple. That's that's pretty much what the game does. And the, in the paper, um, Eve, our agent, is always the matcher, and the human would be the describer. And um, the agent says one of three things. It says got it when it knows which image the, uh, the, the director is talking about. Or it says let's move on if it thinks that they've spent way too much time on this current image set and it wants to move to the next image set. Or uh, it could ask the uh, human to describe, give more details um, so, that it, I mean, so that they can uh, identify what image it is and it still has time basically. So yeah, okay, uh, let's look at a demo of how the, um, uh, the game is played. So that's, the, that's how the game is played, that's Eve playing the game. And um, so let's, okay now, um, like I said, they implement something called uh, incremental processing, right? So let's look at what that is. Uh, so before we talk about incremental processing, let's see what non-incremental processing is. Uh, let's talk about a typical system, say Siri. Uh, does Siri wait for you to finish talking or uh, does she interrupt while you're talking? She's definitely polite, right? She, she waits, yeah. Exactly. Uh, she waits for you to finish talking, and once the user completes talking, it processes it, and then converts uh, the input speech to the text, and then understands it, and then uh, it responds appropriately. So this is a non-incremental processing. A non-incremental processing uh, might be good for Siri, a personal assistant. Uh, but what if uh, Siri were to play this game? Uh, how do you think she would perform? Uh, maybe decently, but uh, there's a disadvantage for this system. Uh, what do you think the disadvantage is? Not maximizing time. Exactly. So, uh, so uh, there's definitely an increase in the response time. Uh, so a user might take very long time to give the input. So let's see what happens if you let a person talk forever. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to put you through this. <laughs> Two. Hey, Flash, I'd love you to meet my friend. Uh, darling, I've forgotten your name. Hmm. Officer Judy Hobbs, CPD, how are you? I am doing just fine as well <laughs> as I can be. What Hang in there. can I do? Well, I was hoping you could run a play for you. Well, I was hoping you could today. <laughs> Well, I was hoping you could run a play press. We 
We are in a really big hurry. Okay, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now let's look into incremental processing. Uh, so, in incremental processing, the system processes as and when the user talks. Uh, so, typically, pro it, uh, the processing happens at regular intervals of time, and then the system responds as soon as it understands where the user is getting at, uh, instead of waiting till the end. Uh, so now I'll show you like a demo of how it would be if yeah if Indu were a non-incremental agent and an incremental agent and I were the director. Uh, so we have a we have an image set uh, which has like four pictures uh, out of which three are dogs and uh, one's a cat and uh, the cat is our uh, target image. Okay. So, so she's the non-incremental agent now. Um, so I will. I see a cat that's wearing a black suit, a red tie. Um, I think it's got, it's wearing a white collared shirt. It's got its tongue out and bluish green eyes, I guess. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, supposing she were an incremental agent. I'm, I'm say, Eve now. Yeah, she's Eve now. And I say, I see a cat. Got wearing, it. Yeah. So, so she, I mean, that's the cat is the distinguishing factor, right? So that's enough for the agent to get it. So clearly, the uh, the response time for incremental processing is much uh, lesser when compared to the response time for the non-incremental processing. Uh, that's because in this particular example, uh, the word <laughs> cat itself is the distinguishing factor, and it is enough for me to identify that that particular image is the target image, and any other information like red tie or white collar t-shirt is not necessary. So let's take a look at the agent design. Yeah, okay. So um, yeah, looking internally to the system, the, it's composed of two main modules. One is the automatic speech recognition and the other one is the natural language understanding module. Um, so the ASR works first, it um, basically uh, I recognizes the user speech. So as uh, the user starts talking, it starts it's it's processing the user speech and converts it to text form. And uh, what the NLU does is it's actually a naive based classifier the NLU. So um, and it which is also trained on some prior data, so that it's able to identify from a set of words which image the uh, user is talking about. So um, <clears throat> the NLU obtains the set of words from the ASR and then it. Uh, basically classifies it to the right image and um, the system internally it assigns probabilities to each image uh, based on this classification so uh, if we look at the three individual architectures um, we can see how it works so in uh, the fully incremental version both the ASR and the NLU are in incremental modes so um, as the user starts talking in every hundred milliseconds interval the ASR starts processing the user's speech Converts it, converts it to text and passes it down to NLU immediately, which again starts processing it in that, that every 100 millisecond uh, interval. It looks at the words seen so far and it starts classifying it, assigning probabilities just as it works. And at some point, as the user continues talking, at some point the, there'll be one image with a really high probability, high enough for it to decide that that's the target image, and it immediately responds or guesses that as the target image. Um, so the response time is obviously much more. Um, in our partially incremental uh, version, um, only the ASR is in, uh, is in incremental mode. So it works as the user starts talking, as usual, 100 milliseconds, starts processing it, uh, obtains the text, but it does not pass it down to the NLU immediately. NLU waits for the ASR to completely finish processing, of uh, getting all the text that the user has said, and then it, the NLU classifies it to the right image, and then it responds. Um, in a non-incremental version, like you guess, it's both are non-incremental, so waits for the user to completely finish talking, and then the ASR is triggered, uh, processes the speech, obtains text, passes it to NLU, blah, 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 and, the, and it finally responds. So um, basically, non-incremental version, clearly, it has to wait for two whole modules to complete processing after the user's finished talking, so it's definitely going to take a lot more time for it to respond. Uh, partially a little lesser, but definitely our incremental system is going to respond much quicker. Uh, so when do you think the agent should interrupt the user and uh, say either give up I, I, or uh, let's, uh, or got it? When it finds that keyword, like, mm -hmm. like Okay. Like yeah. the cat in the example. Right, right. right. So, so basically that, that um, keyword will help you classify, it, it uh, helps you give a high probability to one image. 
So uh, whenever the probability for a particular image goes over a threshold called the identification threshold, the agent assumes that this particular image itself is the target image and uh, it gives out the response, uh, saying, got it. So uh, it is at this time that the agent confidently says that it has identified the image. There is also an other threshold called the give up threshold. So if the elapsed time goes over a give up threshold, uh, then the agent responds saying that, let's move on to the next question. Uh, so there are times when the probability is not high enough. So at those times, it, uh, we, it, it looks at the elapsed time. If the elapsed time is less than uh, the give up threshold, then it asks the user to give more information about the image, uh, maybe more description about the image, uh, so that it helps the agent uh, distinguish the image better. Or if, if the threshold goes over the, uh, I mean, if the time, elapsed time goes over the give up threshold, then you know, it just skips to skip that particular question and move on to the next question. I'd like to ask a question to the group. So it's like, uh, just in general, like, okay, these are dialogue policies, and uh, for this task, they seem to work well. Um, how do you come up with these numbers? Like, how do you come up with the identification threshold and the give up threshold? How do you do that? You could either use statistical analysis, or if you could just learn a threshold, which you see. Okay, so. so I'm interested in the the learning process. <laughs> like maybe on an average, how much time in the non-incremental, uh, like maybe uh, how much how much of the features are required to correctly identify, and even if the in the non-incremental process, if ASR and NLU are taking some certain amount of time, but then the evaluation, actual evaluation, how many features are necessary for the actual evaluation? Mm -hmm. and how much time is taken in that duration? Maybe that can be our threshold, or maybe like plus minus some particular time frame. So, in a few uh, videos, okay, check. Let's um, say we have out of 100 videos, we, uh, we cannot sample everything, right? Let's say four or five videos <coughs> take a sample it manually, then get a threshold and try to apply that threshold again, just check if that works. Okay. Yeah. Isn't the goal to, to mimic human to human to, uh, interaction? So then you would put two people playing the game and see if the computer can match that? Because if it's faster, then we will miss it. If it's slower, we will be annoyed. So, you, so if, it, yeah. if it needs to match humans, <coughs> then we better get the data from the humans. That, yeah, so that, that would be a good way to get the give up threshold. Um, and then the identification threshold is a probability. I don't think humans really like have yeah. those probabilities, right? Um, so I think where I wanted to get at is kind of like um, that this could be done in a, uh, because it's, it's sort of like a hyperparameter for the system. The system, because it's naive based, produces probabilities anyways, um, but we don't know um, based off of the naive base, like when we want to make the decision, uh, but it could be learned from your training data and like or evaluated on your development set or validation uh, data. So that's kind of like where I wanted to get at. So so this is sort of like a hyperparameter of the system um, that could be validated through training data, and you could simulate the. Uh, incremental or the fully incremental uh, system even if you don't have that available using human data for example um, by just like identifying when you could be getting the right the correct um, response you could, you could use like HMMs for like transition probabilities so like right. unidentified to identified could be like yep. a transition and probably gradually learn that or kind of like uh, reinforcement learning yeah, the user gives input and learns accordingly. That'd be, that's an interesting point, yeah. Cool, yeah. So uh, now that we've seen how the system works internally, let's uh, look at the video to make things clearer.
It is a cat. Gone in. It is a yellow bird. Gone in. Celery. Gone in. It is a sleeping black and white cat. Gone in. So, which one is it? Bridge sign. Gone in. A green bike with tan handlebars and seat. Gone in. Two fingers with thumb. I don't think I can get that one. Incremental uh, system is much lower when compared to the fully incremental system and partially incremental system. Uh, why do you think so? So, like, um, let's take the bikes category. If if it got an image set from bikes and you suppose the GD is zero, so like literally a non-incremental, it wouldn't. I mean, uh, it will just give up as soon as like the person finishes talking, and if they have it, it hasn't guessed till then. So, but whereas for uh, full incremental, it has like 18 seconds. So the GD would it like wait for the if it still hasn't gotten it, it'll ask him to continue talking. Why not give more? Um, Because it's the response latency, it's trying to reduce that, right? 
So, um, so yeah, so we actually see that it's, it does really well. Uh, it does better than partial incremental and non incremental in terms of per second. And in fact, even better than humans um, in the same category. Can you guys know why, why that's possible? So? Okay, I mean, um, intuitively what we think is that maybe because uh, full incremental systems have a set GT, a threshold, and it does, it just gives up if it, if it doesn't go over that, and, and humans might end up spending more time with some questions if they're, you know, they and think they can definitely get it, but then they still yeah. haven't, or something like that. I mean, yeah, so it's, it's possible that humans aren't exactly optimizing time when the agent is trying to do that. They try to get the question right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So it does well in terms of points per second, and that's I mean that's like a positive result for this paper. Um, so your pride gets in the way. But isn't it uh, yeah. like the time duration is is like there is a risk, uh, specific time duration in which the game is played, and in that case, if points earned by humans are more, so mm, they try. Definitely. Yeah. So you're right. I mean, obviously, in terms of the game, humans are performing best. Like, I mean, ultimately, you just want points. So, if they are having, like, points per second, then it's less. I'm just trying to analyze, like, how they are getting much of a difference in, like, if they are spending more time on one particular figure and they're not passing it on, then They are getting the answers, answers right. right. Humans are getting the answers right, but they are taking more time. Yeah. yeah. No, but then the time frame of the entire game. Is there a fixed time frame? I do, yes. I I think it yeah, is. I think there's a timer. But, um, but it might be like a large enough time to guess everything. Yeah. As yeah. in, the, the agent is trying to optimize time. It, must, it might have finished yeah. the whole game in like much lesser time than yeah. humans did. I, I mean, mean, they won't, yeah. Yeah. Basically. The time taken by the system to optimize, it's not taking enough time to optimized, right? Then say, suppose a human is able to um, give the right result by taking more time, but if uh, the system is not giving that answer just because it is op trying to optimize and it's not giving the right result, does that mean ki if the system needs to be trained to take a little more time means it's not taking mm -hmm. consideration of that Maybe. optimal, Maybe. optimal time? <clears throat> Maybe. I mean, yeah, that's, it's probably something that the agent has to learn, but I think um, more importantly, I feel like we see that it does better than partially incremental and non-incremental and that's what it's, it's already doing better. Yes, it could do better maybe, do even better, yeah. but it's still performing well right now. So that's, that's what, that's the takeaway from the paper, I guess. Yeah, I think yeah. it might be a bias because of like, there might be a set number of, um, like items that they can guess that could influence it. Um, but what I wanted to point out is also like, so I think the the points per second would be interesting for re reinforcement learning as a, as a good reward um, to uh, update the policy. But what I wanted to ask the group as well is like, um, by reporting results like this, what would you have done better? Mm -hmm. So we just had the statement like, but at least we see that the fully incremental does better than the partially or non-incremental. But do we? Do we see that? Mm. Well, not in all cases. Mm -hmm. No. Yes. no. no. What, what, is, what is missing, so to say? Mean. Mean is not a bad start. Some... Standard deviation, so uh, what else? Like, what what do you do in your homework? <laughs> T-tests or like some statistical testing. And in this case, um, you probably want to look at like the average points per second for each like trial run and like compare those and maybe do a rank test with the number of points. Um, so you want to be more precise about your statements in the paper where you say, okay, like, well, yeah, I see that they're doing absolutely better, but, or like absolute value-ish better, but so let's, 
basically, I mean, if I look at, like, for example, points per second for bikes, it's 0 0.07. Again, 0 0.07, like, that is probably completely within the margin of, like, random. Right. Or it's, it's not outside the confidence interval. And, um, and so that might be the case also for cocktails, but it might not be the case for zoo. So, like, just being a bit more precise and more, like, scientific and mathematically correct about reporting results would be good. Just. Um, finally, we also have some... Um, um, oh, now we, we have, have some feedback. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know we have that. So, yeah, so that, that, that's just like a... Actually, they took a survey um, from the humans um, after they played the game to also see if they, how comfortable they were with the aging and the usual stuff. So yeah, so um, obviously a, humans rated other humans highly in terms of how comfortable they are, they are playing with them, how efficiently they thought they worked together, or, I mean yeah, so it's basically a lot of grounds and they, yeah, they, like I said, how rated other humans highly, but also they rated fully incremental systems really well in comparison to non-incremental and partially incremental. And um, even in, I think, cases where you wouldn't, I mean, um, stuff like, it was, oh no, wait, okay, so my, um, uh, I don't know, okay, stuff like, I felt confident that my partner and I understood each other, I mean, uh, the only difference between these, uh, the incremental systems is just that it actually responds quickly, but they still somehow felt that, you know, they, they actually worked well together. Mm. So, I mean, it just comes with the whole reduced latency and the, just the system working more like humans, I guess. And responding. So overall, it looked like they liked fully documented um, agents, so yeah. So, oh yeah, so we hope that you understood the title of the paper better and from given the contents, content. hopefully. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, good morning. Uh, I am Swami Narayanan and this is Sajir and we are going to be presenting about a paper, Thumbs Up, Sentiment Classification of Text Using Machine Learning Techniques. So what this paper tries to do is, it, try, it tries to achieve text cl uh, classification of a sort. So, usually most of the work in text classification is usually in this realm called topical categorization where by you classify the text based on the topic as the name suggests. So you could, it could either be, you know, it could be a newspaper article and you could classify it like whether it belongs to the politics column or the sports column or the international or business column. So that's one kind of topical classification and another type of topical classification could, could be kind of like, you say, and next slide please. No. So, what do you think the difference is between the text at the, at the top and the text in the bottom? Translate to the same story. <laughs> what points report 
Sacramento State Park. So, the people in the it, back here, like, it's not louder. much about the quotation, it's like to the style of writing. Mm -hmm. like first one is what's that? Yeah, the first one is like a speech uh, kind of thing, the second one is more of a paper newspaper. Yeah, the, the first one is an opinion column. And the second one is a report. It's a news report. Oh. So uh, this is also a kind of topical categorization. The first one, you, the, the author kind of like expresses their opinion about Putin, their opinion about what Russia is doing. What are some assumptions? Some features that you would use yeah. to categorize it that way? Do you see something? Like somebody's taking a stance here, or at harming. Uh, I don't think that a uh, news report would would mention something like that. Um, and and it it's about um, yeah these these like putting uh, like intentions into what is happening rather than just reporting of what is happening. I think is a big difference here. So, uh, th in this paper, what they try to do is they try to approach a pos uh, the problem of sentiment classification. Uh, that is, if there's a piece of text, they want to either classify it as being either positive in emotion or negative in emotion. And they do that by taking movie reviews as their data and try to see if the reviewer thinks that the movie is good or bad, positive or negative. And they are trying to do so by using three different machine learning approaches. One, the first one is naive Bayes, second one is maximum entropy and the step support the machines. <coughs> so they get their movie uh, review data from IMDB and they only consider data which is has a numerical rating like a number of stars or like 9 on 10 or 8 on 10 uh, so that it's easier for their algorithms to work on it rather than a, an algorithm which, uh, rather than a review which doesn't have a rating because then they can't the learning becomes a little more difficult. And so do they just use like one star ratings and five star or ten star ratings for positive and negative or are they using the ones in the middle too or they really have they've been really cryptic about a lot of things in the paper that they have not exactly told mentioned like how they've used so something that you're not going to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Be cryptic this, about. this paper in general, according to me, they, they, they kind of like, there are a lot of black boxes which you mm -hmm. can't see through. And one of them is how they're using the numerical rating and like what they're doing with it. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I don't see that they're using it at all as we will see in further slides. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so they're kind of, and I think the main reason why they're using the numerical rating is for the automatic extraction part because they can easily find the reviews which have the numerical rating and just because the IMDB rating they have a machine extractable format and they can easily like crawl through the pages and get the reviews. And they also don't want to, you know, if a person a particular reviewer might have a particular way of writing reviews, so they don't want to be constrained by that. So they uh, kind of like limit the number of reviews that a, a particular author can have in their data. So I think they have a total of like 144 reviewers represented in their data. And they also uh, kind of like take equal number of positive and negative reviews. I don't know how they did that again. 
they have not mentioned if they had a third person come in and rate those reviews or if they saw that they were positive or negative themselves. But yeah, they claim to have equal uh, distribution of both. And they kind of like tokenize the, the reviews and store them as either unigrams or bigrams as we saw in the last lecture, uh, as Matthew explained in the last lecture. And they uh, uh, consider punctuations as, as separate unigrams themselves. And even in that, they use uh, one of the techniques that Matthew mentioned in the last lecture about adding knots hmm. to the, uh, to a, like if you have is as a unigram, you have is not for isn't, for negation of that to kind of like learn negative context better. Yeah, so in general, I think they kind of make a conjecture, I think that's kind of like intuitively true. Uh, that sentiment based classification is kind of like easier for humans to do than for machines C when com you compare it to topical classification which probably may be easier for machines for like example take say this, this headline that uh, Aramco buys like a 9 billion dollar stake in a Georgian oil company so that could either be a business, so, uh, it could be it, can't, it could come under business. You could classify it as a business-related uh, headline, or it could also be like international headlines because it's Aramco's, like uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, oil company, which is buying stake in another country's oil company. So that like, for it, the topics might be closely related to each other, which might be more difficult for humans to. Kind of like differentiate between rather than uh, sentiments which are more straightforward for humans to differentiate between. Of course, this, this is just a conjecture which they make, which they yet to verify, which they kind of try to do with their results. And also, uh, to kind of like uh, set up their baselines for the, uh, the for their experiments, they kind of like uh, ask uh, three people to come in and kind of like uh, set up these indicator words. Like, like 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 what we saw in today's lecture, a bunch of positive words and a bunch of negative words, and try to kind of like classify based on that for to set up their baselines. So they have in the first case they have two people come in and give a I, they, they, like twenty positive words and like seven negative words, and they make those people themselves classify movie reviews based on these and. Uh, the results for those are here. <coughs> so the first person has a bunch of positive words and a bunch of negative words and they measure the accuracy of the person and for the third human they also claim to use some statistical data to uh, make the decision. I don't know what statistical data they use, that's still a black box, one of many in this paper. But yeah, they, they use these accuracies as their baseline to evaluate their performance. What do you think is kind of like off? I I, I feel I feel like there's something off about this. Do you guys like get any thing? I, I think they kind of like falsify. I, I mean like I don't think this is kind of like a legit way of measuring your baseline or setting up your baseline. Well, I think statistical analysis on the on the sample size of two is obviously interesting. Yeah, <laughs> that, that that of course that is. But even otherwise, like they are actually making these people like give them like positive and negative words and they're going to classify based on the occurrence of these words. So in my opinion, they're like trying to make the humans classify like a machine rather than how a human would do it. So you, you don't, when you read a movie review, you don't go and note how many uh, positive <laughs> words and how many negative words that the review has and classify, you like think about whether the review is positive or negative based on that. You intuitively just know that, okay, this seems positive and this seems negative. So they kind of like make a human classify like a machine and use their data and that might kind of be produce like far lesser accuracy than how a human would intuitively go about the process. But yeah, there's something to think about. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, yeah, Just a quick comment. I feel like uh, what is trying to, uh, try to put in, uh, in that baseline is not really a baseline but the intuition that even human Accuracy, right? It's not really like 80% as a baseline or something like that. But 
later in the uh, results when they evaluate their performance, they kind of like use the results they get in the previous slide as a baseline to say, ah, oh, our uh, algorithms perform better than what humans would do. And mm. I think that's like overgeneralizing it, right. considering the fact that the humans are not approaching it in a very human-like manner. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. And the first approach they use is the often abused naive Bayes classifier. <laughs> and so, could you artificially make the task? So, so did the, um, I, 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 I think I didn't get that, but. Did the human get to read the um, the review in like consecutive words, or did they mumble the words and like so, like randomize the words? Oh no, they read the, they made them cohesively read the review. Yeah, so and count the occurrences of right. the positive and negative words, and based on that's why they have ties yeah. where they have equal occurrences of both positive and negative right. words. And they just, it's, it's like a word count. Yeah, kind of like because a, like there are other things, you know, like sarcasm and stuff that yeah. can happen that might sound positive, but it's negative. And you could pick up on that as a human if you read it. But if you really want to make the human uh, classified on a one gram or n gram kind of basis, you would want to jumble the words so that you don't have the, the consecutive... Um, understanding of like how the sentence is built. And they definitely are not taking the context into yeah. Yeah. Uh, consideration either. So they kind of like, uh, one thing I forgot to mention about uh, earlier is that they use uh, a bag of features kind of like model, kind of like similar to the bag of words model that we saw in the last lecture, uh, to kind of like represent the data while using these uh, machine learning algorithms. So. Uh, so yeah, they kind of like use kind of like a first they try to use this uh, kind of like frequency the word frequency based kind of like bag of features model where they have a word and they have a, uh, the number of times it occurs in a particular document kind of like a measure associated with it. And it, they also assume that all of the, so each uh, feature they assume it to be conditionally independent two words to be the occurrence of words to be conditionally independent to each other, which might really not be the case. But yeah, still, they, they, it does kind of perform well, consider that, considering that they have made this assumption. And they also use advanced smoothing to encounter, un, uh, kind of like un, they don't want to have zero probabilities for anything. So it's like, advanced smoothing, like well, what we saw in last lecture, so say in the spam or not spam example that we had. So if you encounter a word in spam that does not appear in ha uh, not spam, you don't want that to, the, have zero probability, so you can like add one to the numerator and the size the vocabulary to the denominator to kind of like do some probability. And yeah, so again, they measure the results of the uh, naive Bayes algorithm against their baselines, and they see that it performs better, which Sajir will delve into uh, in consecutive slides. And yeah, the second method that they use is the maximum entropy algorithm and yeah so it is, the maximum entropy algorithm is used kind of like for uh, text classification but it need not necessarily always outperform uh, naive BSI, especially in topical classification in which most of the related work is about the references of mostly uh, topical classification where uh, they, you don't really care about the correlation between occurrences of words as much as you do for sentiment intuitively because it's more about keywords, I guess, in topical classification where you have, if it's a business thing, you ex expect words like stocks or trade or something like that. And it doesn't really have to do anything with uh, the context or like other things. And yeah, so again, Maximum entropy does not require a conditional independence uh, assumption between features, so it probably models the uh, situation a lot better than naive Bayes does. Hmm. And uh, then now, yeah, so they kind of like uh, uh, it's kind of like a it's, it's kind of like a binary kind of like classification thing, uh, it's like, it takes binary values, it's like either it's 
there or not there, there or not there kind of like thing. It's so, it really doesn't uh, take the frequency of the words into account in this. Which they, they kind of like use this to kind of like again experiment with it later to really see if word frequency really matters or just if just word occurrence matters. It doesn't matter how many times the author says this movie, is, the, the word bad comes in the movie review perhaps. It just matters that the word bad is used and not how many times it's used. So again, this again they claim that it performs better than the human baseline and marginally better than the naive base algorithm and Saji will take off. Yeah, so uh, moving on we'll, uh, we'll see the uh, support vector machine, how it's being used for this particular problem and then we'll see the results uh, uh, for these classification algorithms and how they're performing compared to each other. Then they are like uh, comparing again with the human baseline evaluation methods like the numbers, then what they do is they're trying to, you know, manipulate the features or manipulate the methods they are using for these features and trying to see if there is any performance improvement. And then again, uh, comparing it with the baseline result as well as the topical classification results. And then, then they are like summarizing their observation about what's, what's, what's different with respect to each of these type of approaches. So support vector machine, uh, you know, uh, it's basically a, uh, it's not really connected to probabilistic uh, you know, based classification. It, it's doing a, uh, uh, it's, it's basically a, um, finding a hyperplane um, vector, like hyperplane represented by a vector W, which will be separating the classes um, to, to two classes. And uh, it, it's just not only does that, it will be just trying to maximize the margin between the two classes. And you can see uh, uh, the, uh, the equation for the vector uh, is uh, like this, which is basically a constraint optimization problem. Um, and yeah, maintains maximum possible separation. Uh, so um, even with support vector machine, it's it's, uh, it's it's much better compared with human baseline numbers, and it's even better than my bias uh, classifier. Um, yeah. So uh, the results um, they are trying to compare and trying to see, trying to use different types of. Uh, features and different, you know, representing them in different possible forms so that uh, they are trying to observe the results and first they try with unigrams. All algorithms are, 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 are performing all baselines. Then uh, it's not, there is not much improvement in SVMs. Then better results in topical classification using the same algorithm, which is obvious. Uh, so it suggests that sediment classification is more difficult than topical classification because there's a drastic difference between the performance they are uh, receiving from topical classification as well as uh, with, uh, uh, with sentiment classification. Then uh, they are trying to use feature frequency versus present. So uh, there are different adjective words in, uh, in them or different words which represent negative sentiment or positive sentiment. And they are trying to see if they should be considering only the presence of that word or just counting the number of occurrence of that word. So uh, they have investigated that and incorporated into the existing machine learning algorithm and seeing the results. Uh, we can see maximum entropy, obviously, as the equation says, it does not take, take frequency into account. Then binary to feature return to only ticket presence and absence of and not frequency. So uh, there's much much better accuracy results for topical like for sentiment classification and uh, which is like a contrary to previous studies because uh, which is like an indication what, that topical classification has frequency much relevant, but com in, in sentiment classification it's not so. Uh, you can like uh, give uh, some hints why is that so? Because it's it's contrary to the earlier studies as the, as per the paper. So topical classification, the frequency matters a lot, but it, when it comes to sentiment, it doesn't really matter. It just uh, the presence of that particular word or the adjective signifies the sentiment. So yeah, we will see in later slides and we have some, some example uh, which will be giving a hint about why is this so. Okay, yeah, biograms. Uh, biograms, uh, they have tried biograms to capture the kind of context information because when you have um, words grouped together, they are assuming that the context will be taken into account and which will be giving more more, more accuracy in the results, but it turns out uh, 
Uh, okay, the attach, and when the, the problem with biograms is they are not really conditionally independent anymore, and it violates by any bias by assumption. So we might assume that it will uh, you know, perform less for naive bias, uh, but it does not really making some bigger impact on the performance in anyway. uh, But um, considering only biograms reduces the accuracy as much as by 5.8 uh, percentage. So the assumption that biograms will take context into account is kind of not you know, giving them any, any good result. So which is again um, um, something for future study, like how can we how can we take context into account um, even if you know, but if biogram is performing poorly, what, what is the thing that will make it better, uh, like make 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 uh, context information in, in a better way? Do do people have an intuition why the biograms might be working worse here in this case? You know, in the case of movie review, perhaps the you know taking only two words together to. Mm -hmm. A consecutive words together does not really give you any sense of context at all. So it might not really give us. It, it's not a big context, yeah. Uh, yeah. but yeah. also, what 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 are you doing to like your kind of also changing the nature of your features a little bit, right? Um, so if you let's say you have a. Uh, a dictionary of a thousand words and like if you do unigrams you have a thousand dimensional feature vector and if you do biograms that changes a lot right and uh, so you're like there are lots it's, so, so in, if you only have 700 movie reviews and you use biograms um, the these biograms are happening a lot more sparse, like you don't see those happen that many times. Mm -hmm. So that might be a problem. Um, that, and then the add one smoothing has a much higher effect now um, because you need to add one to all possible biograms. And yeah, so, so there are lots of um, potential issues there. Theoretically, biograms should work better if you have enough data, yeah. theoretically, but... Probably an n-gram. Uh, yeah. If, they, if their aim is to capture context information, probably right. an n-gram. Yeah. But we see practically it doesn't help in this case. So, yeah, uh, next is the position that they are taking into account. Usually, uh, position of a word in the text uh, might have some significance when it comes to the sentiment of the uh, review kind of. So, usually, you people start with a summary of the like in the beginning, they'll be giving a summary and then moving, getting into the details, and then towards the end, they'll be giving up. Uh, you know, overall, like people have different ways of uh, putting their review, but this is a pattern they have observed to be, you know, having um, a split up of uh, the first quarter, middle half, and last quarter. They can um, split them in this fashion and see uh, in which uh, like in which segment the particular word is occurring and. Uh, that position can be taken into account, but uh, for their study, uh, there, are, there was no significant improvement in the results. And yeah, uh, to improve, uh, they, they expect uh, to have more refined approach to these problems uh, to improve the results. Yeah, then again, with uh, parts of speech, um, you have certain part of speech tagging done for documents. So, for example, you have I love this movie, this is a love story. So how can we categorize these two different uh, types of sentences? And uh, um, they have tried approaching, um, um, you know, taking this into account and seeing the accuracy improvement. Again, uh, there is no improvement in the accuracy. There is decline for SPM, not for uh, maximum entropy, but marginal improvement for neighbors. And yeah, then uh, anal analysis of considering only adjectives, so, um, which is kind of similar to the human-based uh, approach where uh, it was, I think almost all the words they have you know, listed in, in that box were adjectives. So they have tried to uh, take into account only the adjective words and see if there is any uh, you know, performance impact and they see poor results coming out of it. But interestingly, when they use most frequent unigrams, uh, it's, it's coming out to be better, um, which is like a, you know, uh, an interesting result again. Uh, 
So feature selection algorithms on Unigram's may improve performance. That is what they are assuming based on the results. Because when they talk, take into account adjectives um, based on their apparatus, there is not much improvement. But when they came to uh, most frequent Unigrams, there is a good measure of uh, results coming out. So they expect to have feature selection algorithms in place uh, which can improve the uh, Yeah, discussion. So overall, uh, machine learning algorithms perform better than human based, and we have the results in later slides. Uh, so relative performance is um, uh, you know, on top uh, when it comes to performance, and yeah, all others follow. And accuracy is not as good as one for topic classification using the same algorithm. So Unigram presence information is found to be more uh, most effective. Then feature presence versus feature frequency, um, uh, there is a contradiction there. And uh, yeah, so now we come uh, we come to the you know question: Why is this different, and why is the topical classification uh, really really better uh, when you come when you compare with sentiment classification? And so yeah, so this is about uh, you know uh, thought or expectation um, where we have uh, uh, people reviewing a movie, something like the movie is good. Uh, the actors are excellent, but I hated watching it. So the last word will, will be you know having more importance compared to the others. But if you just count or if you approach them with statistical model, then you will be getting a different result. So it would be like the movie had Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. Is it, in it. It's a, he's a good actor, it was directed by Steven Spielberg. He's a good director, but the movie was really bad. So if you go for either feature presence or feature frequency, they're going to have good. Uh, positive and negative indicators in them, so that get, kind of like confuses the. So uh, it, it applies to not only to movies, to mobile phone apps. Like it, it has a good processor, good RAM, but it explodes when you put it for that. So, so, so all these you know information, uh, uh, you know, are pointing towards the situation. You have to approach the review content differently compared to topical classification, and it, it matters a lot. So, uh, uh, there is, uh, yeah, what about multimodality uh, when it comes to reviews? It, we have been only analyzing textual content. So, how it, how it matters when it comes to videos. You can observe, like, people will tend to give more sarcastic remarks when it is a video because they have other visual cues to inform sarcasm in a better way compared to text. So, we can observe uh, more uh, sarcasm in video reviews. That's what I used to see in video reviews. Where someone was saying a movie review, uh, the movie is good, but it does it is not as good as the book. So which book? Any book. <laughs> so uh, that's what people say. They will they will always include sarcastic and then which you will take some time to you know understand if it is a textual information compared to video. So uh, I think we have to wrap up. Okay. Okay. We are out. Okay. Great. Thanks.